Welcome to my first State of the Second Amendment video, where I'm going to be talking about here's kind of where we're at in the big picture. With ATF pistol brace rulings and everything else going on, it's really easy to lose sight of wins and losses as far as big battles as opposed to little battles. And yes, I understand there's really no such thing as a little battle. Don't go keyboard commando on me, but I think you get the point. Where are we winning? Where are we losing? What are the battles that we have fought behind us? And what battles do I see coming up ahead? And how will they be fought? That is the topic of this video. My name is Tom Grieve. I'm an ex-criminal prosecutor. Let's get into it. So guys, I don't want to make this a super long video. So I understand there's a lot of things that I'm leaving out. I really just kind of want to focus the discussion on how I see it and kind of keep it to the big points. One of the biggest things we have to look at, particularly kind of looking back across the last year, which no is not how I'm limiting this arbitrarily, but of course, New York Rifle State Pistol Association v. Brune. That case came out in June of 2022 and is in many ways up there co-equal, arguably even a bigger deal, but I'm going to say it's co-equal, 1 and 1A with DC versus Heller as being the most important landmark Second Amendment decisions to have come out ever let alone in the last 15 years when they both have come out. Of course, importantly, what Heller basically put down was the fact that, no, the Second Amendment is an individual right. And of course, that was extended to apply to the states. So in other words, uh, whereas Heller applied to the federal government, the states in uh, the McDonald case that came out a couple years later also have that right applied to them. So in other words, you cannot keep your rights at the federal level and then have your local state like, oh, I don't know, arbitrarily picking Illinois, New York, California, New Jersey come to mind as states that are just going to, well, they can take away all your rights. Nope, can't do that. That's what those two cases, Heller McDonald stand for. Then more recently with Bruin, Bruin was very critical for kind of two separate things. The first one is basically saying, yes, the Second Amendment applies to these sorts of activities. And specifically what they said is adult citizens in possession and carrying ordinary weapons to specifically include handguns to non-sensitive locations and folks who are non-prohibited possessors. There's a lot going on there. I get that. If you want me to go into more details about anything, again, let me know in the comment section below. The second most important thing and arguably even more important is the fact that we have a massive legal standard for how everything needs to happen when it comes to conducting a constitutionality test of Second Amendment cases. Because you have to understand that ordinarily, when a law or regulation is affecting a constitutionally protected um, activity, it should be accorded strict scrutiny, which is the highest level of scrutiny by the courts. In other words, yeah, no, this isn't like an interest balancing test of, well, is the public helped out if we destroy this amendment uh, versus this particular individual, things like that. That was more or less what the Second Amendment was even in the wake of Heller 10 years ago. Bruin said, nope, that doesn't work anymore. We tried letting the lower courts come up with something sensible, presumably strict scrutiny, because that's what every other constitutional right is given, and the lower courts all failed. They kept inventing lower standards. And I won't get into that now. Let me know in the different in a comment if you want me to get into that subject for a different video. Here, I want to fill you in on again, just so we're crystal clear what that legal standard is. The legal standard put down v. Bruin, in other words, this is what all new laws and regulations, and not only new, but all old laws and regulations to be held as constitutional must pass. This is the wall that they must clear. So the standard is that the laws and regulations must be consistent with the nation's history of regulations. So we're generally talking 19th century and back. We'll see exactly where the U.S. Supreme Court, SCOTUS, Supreme Court of the United States, SCOTUS, draws the line in the 20th century, but we're generally focused on 19th century and back. Keep in mind that, of course, there was firearm laws and regulations and gun control back in the 19th century, 17th century, and so on. But keep in mind, those laws were basically focused on making sure that slaves, freed slaves, Native Americans, Catholics, and basically just people that they didn't like were not allowed to possess firearms. Right. Very real. So gun control, again, basically started as an anti-African-American, anti-Native American, anti-Catholic, and anti-some other groups that the government was using its power to disarm folks. All right. If you want me to go into that in a different video, again, let me know in the comment section below. 
But that's the history of gun control. And the Bruin decision made very clear that, look, not all history is created equal, guys. So don't try to take some sort of um, anti-freed slave uh, uh, law and, uh, hey, that's good gun control. That's good law. We can use that, which, by the way, prosecutors have already used in Oklahoma. Click on my video in the description below uh, if you want to see that one. So what are the battles so far? Well, there's a handful of them that have already been fought. Number one, that the 2A Second Amendment is an individual right, not a community right. That's Heller. I, you have an individual right to own your firearm. This is not a communal right, which is reserved to like the National Guard, the Army, or something like that. This is you. You down the lens can own a firearm, provided that you don't meet some sort of disqualifying criteria, which we'll get into. Number two, the Second Amendment covers ordinary weapons to specifically include handguns. Now, of course, where are these lines going to get drawn as far as what's an ordinary weapon? We'll get into that later on as well, but that's huge. The inclusion of handguns by name is absolutely huge in recovering ordinary weapons. So what is now gone are all those arguments saying that, hey, the Second Amendment only applies to muskets or something like that, or your uncle's double-barreled uh, duck gun or something, or whatever the case may be. Nope. That's all gone. We've, we've got that. That's that's nailed down by and large, but of course that won't stop the antis from attacking. Number three, the Second Amendment and First Amendment recognize pre-existing rights. They're not a right given by the Constitution. They are a right that the Constitution recognizes as pre-existing beyond place and time. These are things that have already been spelled out by courts, okay? Number four, the Second Amendment is for all adults who are not prohibited possessors. So I realize that there's lots of firearm laws out there that you have to have, for instance, NFA, many concealed carry laws and so forth. We have to be at least 21 years of age. Is that going to be changing now in light of Bruin? Well, to find out. But otherwise, for all adults who are not prohibited possessors. And of course, number five is already covered the rule book for how these fights and battles are going to occur in court. So the battles to come are going to arise in primarily one of three ways in court. And guys, before I get into this, if you've not already done so, please show your support for the Second Amendment as well as this channel if you'd like to see content like that. Help us make that content. It's absolutely free. Like the video as well as subscribe. It helps us grow. It helps basically bringing me back here to the studio to keep feeding the internet beast. We appreciate it. Thank you very much. So again, there are Battles are going to be coming up, and they're going to come up primarily in one of three different ways. Number one, legislation passed by anti-Second Amendment legislatures. We're seeing this across the whole country. New York State, New Jersey, Rhode Island, uh, Colorado, New Mexico, Illinois, just I can keep going on and on and on, unfortunately, of legislatures who are reacting to the Bruin decision and are basically passing their own versions of assault weapons ban, low capacity magazine uh, mandates, so you can't have anything above 10 rounds. I've also heard nine rounds. I've also heard eight rounds. Of course, everything is getting bandied about right now. Um, all these sorts of things. So I was talking about new legislation that's coming into effect. That's number one. Number two, government agencies who seek ongoing regulation. Could we be talking about bump stocks? Could we be talking about pistol braces? Could we be talking about forced reset triggers? All the above? There you go, all of the above. So we're talking about predominantly the ATF and the Second Amendment space, but of course we'll see if any other agency gets involved in the action. But obviously, as the ATF reclassifies things, walks back their rulings and so forth, that's going to trigger opportunities, depending on how you look at it, for litigation. So that's obviously going to be another way that things make it to court. Number three, the challenging of existing laws and regulations already on the books prior to Bruin. I read an article, I don't know if this is true, but I saw it on the internet, so it probably is, that more firearm laws have been overturned in 2022 following the Bruin decision than in all of the cumulative previous 70 years. That was the effect in basically six months of the Bruin decision. Again, I saw it on the internet, so it's probably true, but there you go. So how will these legal battles be fought in the courtroom? This is going to be really important because we're going to see a unique set of legal challenges as far as how these constitutionality um, analysts come into play. And we're already seeing this as recommendations, by the way. If you want me to do a video on the playbook of the anti-Second Amendment crowd, because there's a professor who put that out there, so look, here's the playbook for how we need to challenge this and basically rein this in and crush the Second Amendment, let me know in the comment section below. But borrowing one thing that was obvious, and I already done a video about uh, or made a reference to it, 
and now I saw it on that guy's playbook. The use of historical experts, really from both sides, to try to frame their arguments as being the ones that are most consistent with history and tradition. And we've already seen this come up in uh, litigation so far, where folks are integrating in the use of experts as part of their courtroom um, testimony, as part of their evidence for when the constitutionality of a statute or regulation is being challenged for, no, I have this expert saying, nope, this is absolutely lawful, or nope, it's absolutely unconstitutional, it's absolutely outside the tradition. That's really their role is to establish, here's what the tradition was, and then if the court allows them to go into it, whether or not the existing legislation or regulation is consistent with that tradition. Okay, because if it is, if it falls within the nation's um, tradition of firearm regulation, then it's probably going to be held as being constitutional. If it falls outside the nation's tradition of firearm regulation, then it will probably be unconstitutional. That's basically what it is. And that's the reason why these experts are going to be so important and unique to the Second Amendment area of law. So what are the battleground issues going to be? We've been talking about how things are going to be fought, how things are going to come up, and how they're going to be uh, litigated in court. So here's five things that I think are going to be coming up. And number five is huge. So be sure to stick around for that. Number one, who are adult citizens? I teased this before, but what's the age of majority when it comes to the Second Amendment? Is it 18 or is it 21 or is it something different altogether? I've heard some anti-Second Amendment folks suggest that, hey, we should raise the age for possession of handguns to 30 or higher. I don't think that's actually going to go anywhere, but just the same, those ideas are floating around out there. Of course, particularly we're talking about a lot of states concealed carry laws, which currently have a 21 years of age majority, as well as, of course, NFA possession uh, and, of course, handguns in general. Sometimes you have the 21 as well. Understatement, but there it is. Number two, what's the definition of ordinary weapons? Are we talking about NFA? So what about, oh, I don't know, pistol braces? Is the upwards of perhaps 40 million pistol braces, is that an ordinary weapon and therefore now subject to Second Amendment protections? What about bump stocks? Is that going to be covered? What about forced reset triggers? Are accessories in general? So for instance, one of the arguments against magazines coming from the anti-Second Amendment crowd is, look, these are an accessory and therefore they are not protected by the Second Amendment. So are magazines going to be part of the Second Amendment? Or is that not going to be part of the Second Amendment? And if so, is regulation going to be consistent or inconsistent with tradition? Obviously, I have my viewpoints. If you want me to do a video specifically dedicated to magazines, let me know. But there you go. What about all the language we see about so-called assault weapons, which, of course, most recently has now been expanded to assault pistols? Can't believe I've never seen those words come together like that. But there you go. So assault weapons, what's they're going to be their definition? And of course, what's the ATF's interpretation of something like um, an SBR, an SBS, machine guns, all that kind of stuff. Okay, so ordinary weapons, accessories, NFA, uh, all that kind of stuff as well, um, ARs, AKs, and so forth. Number three, and this is going to be huge, is sensitive locations. This is really going to be more important for the folks who are living in anti-Second Amendment states as frankly Almost everything here is going to be, at least in the short run, until, of course, everybody moves out of California into your state, and then we're all living in a place like Arizona, Colorado, or maybe soon to be Idaho, where things start switching the other way. But sensitive locations. This has been one of the biggest areas of attack that we've seen from anti-Second Amendment legislatures from coast to coast of how do we go about and push back on things after New York Rifle State Pistol Association v. Broom couple specific ways. Keep in mind that Bruin has said that there is uh, there are certain government buildings such as legislative assemblies or courthouses or the government is acting within the heartland of its authority. Their wording, not mine, but the heartland of its authority. That's a sensitive location. So U.S. Supreme Court basically said you can ban carry there, carry there may be banned. Polling places, another place where carry can be banned. Schools, that's a place where carry can be banned. But what about anything after that? That's really where the Bruin court basically cut the bright line and said, okay, that's all in as places where it can be illegal to ban. Everything else, we're looking at whether or not those locations are analogous to one of the three locations we just covered. So that's going to be the question. We've seen, of course, legislators try to regulate uh, gas stations, as being places where you cannot be within 100 feet of while being in possession of a firearm. 
I don't know how they're going to directly uh, win that in court as being a polling place, a government building, specifically government buildings that have legislative assemblies, courthouses, or they're acting within the heartland of their authority. So we're not talking merely about libraries or something. I also don't know how they're going to convince a court that a gas station and a school are basically one and the same thing. But again, this is the sort of battles that we're going to see play out there. So um, maybe a playground, is that going to be close enough to a school? We've already had one courtroom say yes. Link to that decision in the description box below. Once more, where are they going to wind up drawing that fine line? All right, because that's going to be very important. Also, of course, not mentioned are post offices and national park stations. Uh, you heard it here first. I hope there's going to be lawsuits on those challenging. We'll see where that winds up going. But right here, of course, that's been left out to dry by the Bruin Court. Number four, prohibited possessors. So where does the line start for prohibited possessors? The court has already said certain prohibited possessors, yep, as a concept, we've blessed that, that's in. Okay, but what are the details of that in a post-Bruin world? Are we talking about red flag laws? Because of course, red flag laws are not part of our nation's history and traditions. They're obviously a very recent invention. What about injunctions? Oh, we already saw that. Of course, see that linked in the description box below, but that's only happened from one particular court. Where will that go from here? So our domestic abuse or harassment injunctions and so forth that uh, different trial courts issue or court commissioners issue, are those going to be valid? What about people who use controlled substances, whether that's marijuana or whether that's codeine laced cough syrup? Because as it stands right now, it's illegal for those folks, even if it's lawful in your state, it's illegal for you to be in possession of a firearm combined with being an unlawful user under federal law, which everybody is, of marijuana as an example. What happens there? Again, we already did a video on that as well. What about mental health? So this doesn't have to be going all the way to uh, a military veteran who made a disclaimer about having PTSD or mild depression or something like that, and now may find themselves blocked out somewhere. But what's going to be the line of mental health? Is that going to be far reaching? Are there going to be mandatory tests and disclosures? I know that some legislatures have suggested that folks who want to purchase ammunition have to go through psychological screening. So where's going to be the line of mental health? And are those bans, of course, all the bans we're talking about, are they temporary or are they permanent? What are disqualifying convictions? That's obviously the big one here under number four that I know you're all waiting for. Felony convictions, do they have to be for violent felonies? Do they have to be for certain types of violent felonies? Is it just any felony? Can you be rehabilitated from those felony convictions? In other words, after five years or five years post-serving your sentence, are you good to go? Are you only good to go on certain offenses but not others? What about misdemeanor convictions? So in other words, these are criminal charges where they do not rise to the level of facing greater than a year of incarceration. All right. Um, are they in or out? Particularly, we're talking about misdemeanor crimes of domestic violence, which was new as of the mid-90s under the Lautenberg Amendment. So once more, we get all those different things. Before we get to number five, again, if you made it this far in the video, please take a moment, like, comment, subscribe, share. Helps us get the word out there, helps us make more of these videos. Number five, of course, is who can make the laws and rules? Is this gonna be something coming out of Congress? Or is this gonna be something coming out of government agencies? We did a fantastic video about this, talking about Cargill v. Garland, which came out of the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals. We're also talking about, of course, the Chevron uh, issues that come out there as far as government agencies passing rules, which can have massive effects. And whether or not, look, you know, these things can be held to be constitutional and government agencies like the ATF are going to be allowed to pass rules and make interpretations that suddenly classify individuals uh, and sweep them underneath from being a, a lawful area to now pushing them into an area where that same weapon, which was lawful on day one, is now a felony on day two. Another thing under this, number five, is the fact that there can be massive differences between the states. So what is lawful in one state might be a felony in another state. What kind of protections as a result are we going to see when it comes for folks who are traveling across state lines? Or are there going to be no protections? I realize it's the Firearm Owners Protection Act from 1986, but just the same, where is that going in a post-Bruin world where we see a militarization of many different legislatures and a patchwork of laws developing across the country, which in many ways is much more disparate and disjointed five years from now, perhaps, than where they were five years ago? Guys, what kind of topics do you want me to see me cover in the 2A space? What kind of videos do you want to see out there? 
I'm curious because I know I have my ideas and seemingly there's no end to that list. You can ask Derek behind the camera about that. He's nodding his head enthusiastically right now. There seems to be no end in sight. What do you think are the biggest threat areas coming up on the horizon? Where are the biggest issues going to be coming from? And how do you think our court system is going to wind up reacting? Let me know in the comment section below. If you've hung around this long in the video, both myself and the algorithm appreciate and thank you for it. And as always, we'll see you in the next one. Thanks for seeing my first State of the Second Amendment video. Guys, if you enjoyed this video, you might like some of the other content that we've been up to recently. Please feel free to check out these other videos. We'll see you in the next one.